So this is the activity video for Chapter 26, The Urinary System. Part 1, Urolithiasis. David was in his office hard at work when he was struck with a very sudden and intense pain in his side and lower back. He remained at his desk, breathing deeply, and the pain began to recede. Five minutes later, the pain was not as severe, but David was still uncomfortable and decided to call his physician and make an appointment for that afternoon. One of David's colleagues drove him to the doctor's office. While on the way to the appointment, David experienced another bout of severe pain and began to feel nauseous. The pain seemed to be spreading into his lower abdomen and groin. The doctor requested an abdominal x-ray, several blood tests, and urinalysis. As David supplied the urine sample, he was disturbed to notice that the urine had a pinkish cast. The physician returned and informed David that he had a kidney stone, which based on its size should pass on its own within a day or so. The doctor told David that he should rest at home until the stone passed, drink at least two to three quarts of water each day, and strain his urine in order to retrieve the stone for analysis. The doctor also gave David a prescription for pain medication. David passed the stone the following morning and brought it to the doctor's office. Analysis of the stone composition revealed that it was a calcium stone. David's blood and urine test had also shown high calcium levels. Based on this, the doctor told David to eat fewer foods containing calcium. He also told David to continue to drink at least two quarts of water each day. So here is what uh, kidney stones would look like on an x-ray. So you can see this person has stones in both kidneys. And here is a kidney stone after it has passed. Question number one. Describe the flow of urine from creation to elimination. So the process starts in the glomerular capsule in the network of capillaries called the glomerulus. And this is taking place inside the nephron, which is the working unit of the kidney. Once the blood passes through the glomerulus, it is filtered, and the filtrate then travels to the proximal convoluted tubule, and then into the nephron loop, also called the loop of Henle, and then into the distal convoluted tubule. All of these structures together make up the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney. The distal convoluted tubule then passes the filtrate or tubular fluid, out into a collecting duct. So a collecting duct collects filtrate from multiple nephrons. And then multiple collecting ducts empty the uh, fluid into a papillary duct. And at this point, we can start calling the fluid urine. And then the papillary duct is going to uh, secrete the urine through the renal papilla, which is at the apex of the renal pyramid. The urine is collected in a minor calyx and several minor calyces come together to form a major calyx, and then multiple major calyces will come together to form the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis then funnels the urine into the ureter, and so this is the point at which the urine is leaving the kidney. So up until this point, all of the structures were inside the kidney. And then the ureter is gonna carry the urine to the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder will store the urine until you're ready to eliminate it from the body, and then it will pass through the urethra to the exterior of the body. Question number two. Describe the three main processes of urine formation and where each process takes place in the kidney. So the first step is filtration, and this occurs across the filtration membrane of the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle. So remember that you have the glomerular capillary that contains the blood that is entering through the afferent arteriole, and the hydrostatic pressure is the driving force for filtration, which is the blood pressure within these blood vessels. The uh, blood is then forced across the filtration membrane, so water and small solutes from the blood plasma passes over the filtration membrane. And this membrane is made up of three layers. You have the layer of the fenestrated capillary endothelium that is lining the capillary itself. There is a basement membrane, 
and then you have the filtration slits of the podocytes that surround the glomerular capillaries. And then the water in small solutes that is filtered out, which we now call the filtrate, is then collected in the capsular space uh, within the glomerular capsule. The net filtration pressure, which is usually 10 millimeters mercury, forces water and small solutes out of the glomerular capillaries and into the capsular space. And remember that this is a non-selective process. Anything small enough to pass through the pores of the filtration membrane will get filtered out. So the next major process of urine formation is reabsorption. This is going to occur at the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. So reabsorption involves the movement of water by osmosis from the tubular fluid back into the bloodstream, and also the movement of solutes from the tubular fluid back into the bloodstream. And this is a selective process, so only solutes for which we have transport proteins will get reabsorbed. This allows us to keep things in the body that we don't want to lose. So in the PCT, you have reabsorption of organic nutrients, ions, and water. In the nephron loop, you have reabsorption of water in the descending limb and reabsorption of sodium and chloride in the ascending limb. In the DCT, you have reabsorption of water and ions, which are primarily under hormonal control, like with aldosterone, ADH, and parathyroid hormone. And then in the collecting duct, you have reabsorption of water and ions, again, primarily under hormonal control. And then the third main process of urine formation is secretion. And this takes place mainly in the DCT and the collecting duct, although small uh, amounts of secretion can happen elsewhere as well. So secretion is the movement of some solutes and additional waste products from the bloodstream and into the tubular fluid. And again, this is a selective process, so only things for which you have transport proteins are going to get moved. And secretion allows the body to get rid of waste that wasn't filtered out in the first step because, remember, filtration was non-selective. Number three, what are the three main waste products excreted in urine? So the first of the three main waste products is urea. Urea is the most abundant organic waste. We make about 21 grams of urea every day. And urea comes from the breakdown of amino acids, and amino acids come from the breakdown of proteins. So deamination is a function of the liver, where the amino group is removed from an amino acid. These amino groups that are removed are then converted to ammonia, and the ammonia is then converted into urea, which goes back into the bloodstream and then is filtered out by the kidney. So the formation of urea comes from breaking down proteins. So proteins are broken down into amino acids. The liver strips the amino group off of the amino acid and makes ammonia. And then ammonia is converted into urea. The next major waste product is creatinine, which is produced by skeletal muscles as a byproduct of creatine phosphate metabolism. And creatinine clearance can be used to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. And the third main waste product is uric acid, which is a waste product produced from the recycling of nitrogenous bases from RNA. So high concentrations of uric acid can lead to a condition called gout. Number four, think back to calcium regulation. We covered this in AMP1 and then again in Chapter 18. If a person eats a diet high in calcium, what hormone is released and what effects does this hormone have? So eating a diet high in calcium could cause an increase in blood calcium levels. And an increase in blood calcium levels above normal, so above like 11 milligrams per deciliter, would cause the release of calcitonin by the thyroid gland. And calcitonin has three main effects to lower blood calcium levels. 
more calcium will be deposited into the bones, so calcium taken out of the blood and put into the bones. More calcium will be excreted in the urine, so again, calcium taken out of the blood and put into the urine. And less calcium will be absorbed in the digestive tract, which helps to prevent uh, further rises in blood calcium levels. Number five, think about the nature of the calcium ion. How do you think calcium ions are handled by the kidney, through reabsorption or secretion? How then do you think calcitonin affects the way the kidney handles calcium ions and where in the nephron would this regulation take place? So calcium is a small charged ion that can easily dissolve in water because it does have a charge and that makes it hydrophilic. That means that calcium, because it's so small and because it's dissolved in water, will easily be filtered out through the filtration membrane in the glomerulus to become part of the filtrate. So it is small enough to pass through the filtration pores. Since most of the calcium is going to end up in the filtrate, the kidney would handle calcium ions mainly through reabsorption. So the kidney will reabsorb calcium out of the filtrate as needed. The PCT is the primary site of reabsorption, and about 50 to 60% of the calcium in the filtrate is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Calcium reabsorption in the DCT, or the distal convoluted tubule, is under the control of hormones. So the presence of parathyroid hormone would increase the reabsorption of calcium in the DCT. So when you have calcitonin being released instead of parathyroid hormone, this extra reabsorption of calcium ions in the DCT does not occur, and so more calcium stays in the filtrate and is ultimately excreted in the urine. So that is why when you have the release of calcitonin, you end up with more calcium in the urine. Number six, high levels of calcium in urine especially when combined with another molecule called oxalate, can form insoluble crystals that can combine together to form kidney stones. Many stones are formed and passed without causing symptoms. However, a stone at least three millimeters large can cause obstruction of the ureter. Describe the ureters and how they transport urine from the kidney to the bladder. So the ureters arise from the renal pelvis and descend to the urinary bladder. The ureters take a slightly different path in men versus women due to the position of the uterus, which sits superior to the bladder in women. The ureters penetrate the posterior wall of the bladder with slit-like openings called the ureteric orifices, which can help prevent the backflow of urine when the bladder contracts. Peristaltic contractions occur about every 30 seconds, and these help to push the urine from the kidney towards the bladder. This means that when you're passing a kidney stone, you tend to feel pain that comes in waves about every 30 seconds apart. So there are four major types of kidney stones, and in this particular case study, our patient was dealing with a calcium stone but you can also have cysteine stones, uric acid stones, and struvite stones. So calcium stones typically are caused by too much calcium in the urine, which is hypercalciuria. There are some other conditions that can cause these stones as well. Struvite stones are caused mainly by an infection with certain types of bacteria that produce excess ammonia, which then crystallizes and becomes a stone. Uric acid stones are typically caused by too much uric acid in the urine, which can come from eating large amounts of protein, and this is called hyperuricemia. And then there's some other conditions that can contribute to uric acid stones. And then cysteine stones is an inherited condition where you end up with too much cysteine in the urine. So number seven, why would drinking water help to pass the stone? Why would the doctor recommend the patient to continue drinking lots of water? 
So drinking water will cause an increase in urine volume, and the extra urine moving through the ureters could help move the stone along the urinary tract and out of the body. Drinking plenty of water even after passing a kidney stone helps to keep the urine dilute. So dilute urine is going to be less likely to form the crystals that make up the kidney stones than concentrated urine because dilute urine has a lower solute to water ratio, meaning you've got more water compared to the amount of solute. Drinking plenty of water on a daily basis is actually the number one tip and recommendation for preventing the formation of kidney stones in the first place. Number eight, describe the difference between dilute and concentrated urine. Which hormone is responsible for this difference and how does this hormone control urine concentration? So dilute urine contains a lot of water and a small amount of dissolved solute, so it will look very light yellow, so light yellow to clearish. Concentrated urine contains less water and a lot more dissolved solutes, so it will be a much darker color. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, controls urine concentration by controlling facultative water reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So when you have little to no ADH, there will be no aquaporins inserted into the cell membranes of the cells in the DCT and collecting duct, and very little water will be reabsorbed in these areas, resulting in a large volume of dilute urine. This is actually the condition you want because, as mentioned earlier, if you're producing a lot of dilute urine, you are reducing your chances of having a uh, kidney stone, and this happens when you drink a lot of water. So when there is a lot of ADH, and this happens when you're dehydrated, aquaporins are inserted into the cell membranes of the cells in the DCT and collecting duct, and so water is reabsorbed by osmosis in these areas, which results in a small volume of concentrated urine, which is going to increase your susceptibility to kidney stones. So now we move on to part two, the case of the crying baby. Ashley was a beautiful baby girl, but by the time she was six weeks old, her eyes were continually filled with tears. She cried throughout the day and most of the night. Ashley began to run intermittent fevers, but the pediatrician's office did not seem concerned. Despite the use of cloth diapers and meticulous cleaning, Ashley also developed a raw redness and peculiar rash. Ashley's mom changed her diapers every 30 to 60 minutes throughout the day. She noticed that her daughter's diapers were never soaked and often were coated with a thick yellowish discharge. A pediatric urologist recognized the symptoms and requested a urine sample. The specimen was loaded with pus and blood cells. After beginning an antibiotic to treat the urinary tract infection, the doctor also ordered an exam called a voiding cystourethrogram, or VCUG, to, de to test the flow of urine. It turns out that Ashley had inherited a genetic condition that causes malformation of the urinary tract. She had a case of bilateral duplicate collection systems, hydronephrosis, and vesicourethral reflux, or VUR. Ashley's kidney function was markedly decreased on the right and partially limited on the left. While research is still being conducted, it is currently thought that urology reflux problems do have a definite genetic component. For example, it has been determined that patients who inherit a particular form of the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, are at an increased risk for urinary tract abnormalities. While important for its function in the renin angiotensin system, or RAS, ACE also has other functions in the body and plays an important role in the development of the fetus. For this reason, pregnant women are advised to avoid taking ACE inhibiting drugs, which are drugs that are prescribed to lower blood pressure. Number one, describe the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and how it affects the glomerular filtration rate. Why would an ACE inhibitor be prescribed to lower blood pressure? 
and what other processes affect the GFR. So we'll start by mentioning that angiotensinogen is an inactive protein that is found in the plasma. So it is one of those plasma proteins that is secreted by the liver. Renin is a hormone that is released by the juxtaglomerular complex of the kidney when there is a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. And this can occur, for example, when you have a decrease in your blood pressure. So once the kidney releases renin, renin can act as an enzyme and convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is still an inactive form, but as it passes through the lungs, it is converted by an enzyme in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE, and it's converted into angiotensin 2, which is an active hormone. So angiotensin 2 then does the following things to help increase blood pressure, which will then increase the GFR back to normal. So angiotensin 2 will stimulate thirst centers in the hypothalamus, so you end up drinking more water. It causes vasoconstriction of arterioles and precapillary sphincters, which will increase blood pressure. It triggers ADH secretion by the hypothalamus, and then ADH will increase water reabsorption by the kidneys, which keeps water in the body. And it also triggers aldosterone secretion by the adrenal cortex, and then aldosterone will cause the kidney to increase sodium reabsorption, and by keeping more sodium in the body, this also helps the body to hold on to more water, because water moves by osmosis, toward areas of higher solute, so keeping more sodium in the body is increasing the solute concentration, which helps water come out of the filtrate and into the body. So the end result of angiotensin II is to increase blood pressure. So they give people ACE inhibitors to treat high blood pressure by blocking the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II. So an ACE inhibitor blocks this enzyme. And so an ACE inhibitor would prevent the formation of angiotensin II, which prevents angiotensin II from being around to raise blood pressure, and that is why uh, ACE inhibitors are used to treat high blood pressure. So the other processes that regulate the glomerular filtration rate include Autoregulation, which are local myogenic mechanisms to change the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles coming into the and out of the glomerulus. Keep in mind that the larger the size difference between the two arterioles, the higher the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, and thus the higher the GFR. So to increase GFR, you would increase the size difference so, for example, you could dilate the afferent arteriole or constrict the efferent arteriole. And to decrease GFR, you would decrease the size difference. So you would, like, constrict the afferent arteriole or dilate the efferent arteriole. There is also neural control over GFR, and this is primarily by the sympathetic nervous system. So the SNS, sympathetic nervous system, can divert blood flow from the kidney by causing powerful vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, which will decrease GFR. And then in addition to the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, there is other hormonal control in the form of the natriuretic peptides secreted by the heart, which can also affect kidney function. So the natriuretic peptides essentially do the opposite of angiotensin II, and they work to decrease blood pressure and blood volume. They promote fluid loss to reduce blood volume by getting the kidney to make more urine. And they do this by increasing GFR through dilating the afferent arterioles and constricting the efferent arterioles, and by increasing GFR, the kidney then produces more filtrate. They also decrease sodium reabsorption 
and so sodium stays in the urine and that helps to block water reabsorption which keeps more water in the filtrate and thus keeps more water in the urine and that would increase fluid loss which would lower blood pressure and blood volume. Number two, Ashley had a condition called bilateral duplicate collection systems which essentially means that she had four ureters instead of two. Describe the normal organization of the collecting system. How might Ashley's disorder affect urine flow? So let's look at the normal collecting system first. So urine that is produced by multiple nephrons flows into a collecting duct. Multiple collecting ducts then drain urine into a papillary duct. The papillary duct empties through the renal papilla at the apex of each renal pyramid. The urine leaving the renal papilla is collected in a minor calyx. Four to five minor calyces join together to form a major calyx. Two to three major calyces join to form the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis funnels the urine into the ureter, which carries it to the bladder. So here is a picture of what duplicated ureters would look like. And in this picture, one side is normal and one side shows duplicated ureters. Um, in Ashley's case, with bilateral duplicate collection systems, she had two ureters on both sides. So in the case of duplic duplicated ureters, the possible disruption to urine flow depends on the connection of the ureter to both the renal pelvis in the kidney and the bladder. So in some ki cases, a kidney may have two distinct renal pelvises, like that is shown in this image. You can see the ureter at top has its own renal pelvis and the ureter at bottom has its own uh, renal pelvis. But in other cases, there is an intermingling of the calyces and renal pelvis without a clear definition between the two ureters. Sometimes both ureters will connect to the bladder but it can also happen where one of the two ureters is ectopic, meaning that it connects elsewhere, like to the vagina, the urethra, or the vestibule. So the degree of abnormality present will determine the degree of disruption to normal urine flow. Number three, Ashley also had vesicourethral reflux, or VUR which is an abnormal backward movement of urine in the urinary tract system. What usually helps urine to flow in one direction through the urinary tract? So here's an image to show you what VUR is. So VUR is when the urine goes back up the ureter, so it's going from the bladder back up into the kidney. And so over time, this can cause a progressive dilation of the ureter. And then the urine, as it backs up in the kidney, starts pressing up on the structures in the kidney and can eventually actually start damaging the renal pyramids and nephrons themselves. So this would be the most uh, severe case shown here on the right. So normally, the ureters enter the bladder through slit-like openings, the ureteric orifices, that can easily close to prevent the black flow of urine when the bladder contracts. There are also peristaltic contractions in the ureters that help to propel urine from the kidney to the bladder. So in people with VUR, the valve-like openings are malformed or dysfunctional, and urine is able to flow back into the ureters. Deficits in the smooth muscle lining of the ureters, which can disrupt per, uh, peristalsis, can also contribute to VUR. And people who have duplicated ureters, like we saw on the previous page, are at a higher risk for having VUR, likely because one pair of the ureters doesn't connect with the bladder normally. Number four, due to her preceding two problems, Ashley developed hydronephrosis, or urine that abnormally collects in the renal pelvis. This collection of urine can cause the kidney to distend and dilate and can ultimately result in atrophy of the kidney. In fact, Ashley's right kidney was already severely compromised. Can Ashley live with just one kidney? 
So hydronephrosis can be caused by VUR. So as I mentioned earlier, when the fluid backs up into the kidney, uh, depending on how long the condition lasts and the pressure of the backed up fluid, it can uh, dilate the uh, ureter, it can dilate the renal pelvis and all of the calyces, and then start pressing into the uh, renal pyramids, which can do damage to the kidney. So here is a kidney here that has been severely damaged by hydronephrosis. So yes, people can survive with just one kidney. In fact, it only requires that 25% of one of your kidneys function normally in order for you to survive. So we can survive with one-fourth of one kidney. But in cases where both kidneys become severely compromised, hemodialysis is required to remove waste and excess water from, from the bloodstream. And so during dialysis, they actually hook you up to a machine that functions like the kidney and it does all of the filtration functions that the kidney would normally do. Number five, describe the structure of the bladder and differentiate between the urethra in a male and the urethra in a female. So the bladder is stabilized by umbilical ligaments and they're not shown in this particular picture. The mucosa of the bladder contains rugi, which are these little ridges that allow for expansion. The trigone is a region with smooth, very thick mucosa that helps to funnel urine from the ureteric orifices, which are the openings to the ureters, down into the opening of the urethra. So the trigone you can think of as having uh, three points to it, like a triangle. So point one would be the opening of one ureter, point two the opening of the other ureter, and then point three the opening of the urethra. The bladder has a powerful detrusor muscle, it's a smooth muscle, that helps to expel urine into the urethra when it contracts. There is also an internal urethral sphincter, which has, is involuntary, we do not have control over it, and an external urethral sphincter, which is voluntary, and both of these help to control the passage of urine from the body, uh, sorry, from the bladder to the exterior of the body. Stretch receptors in the bladder wall will trigger the urge to urinate. So if we look at the urethra, the urethra in males is seven to eight inches long and transports both urine and sperm. The urethra in females is only one to two inches long and transports only urine. The male urethra, because it's so long and it passes through multiple structures, is divided into three regions. So the prostatic urethra is the part that passes through the prostate gland, which sits just inferior to the bladder. The membranous urethra is the part that passes through the muscles of the pelvic floor. This is also where the external urethral sphincter is located. And then the spongy urethra is the part that actually passes through the penis. So the external urethral orifice in males is at the very tip of the penis, and the external urethral orifice in females is just anterior to the vaginal opening in the vestibule. And so to give you the rest of the story, Ashley's parents elected for her to have reimplantation surgery where the ureters were tapered and implanted higher into the bladder. A flap valve would also be created to prevent urine from reversing into the kidneys. This surgery should simultaneously solve the problem of VUR and hydronephrosis. So in this type of surgery on the left, this shows the uh, ureters coming into the bladder and say that this ends up being too low. And so surgeons can go in and cut the ureter and actually move it up higher so that it empties far higher up on the wall of the bladder so that urine that's collecting in the bladder is less likely to flow backward into the ureter. And then we'll finish up with part three, some miscellaneous questions. Number one, describe the juxtaglomerular complex. What hormone does this endocrine structure secrete? So the juxtaglomerular complex is comprised of three groups of cells. First, you have the macula densa, which is shown in purple in this image. These are epithelial cells of the distal convoluted tubule 
that loops back between the afferent and efferent arterioles of the glomerulus, and the macula densa cells function as chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. Then you have the juxtaglomerular cells, which are located here around the afferent arteriole. These are modified smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole. They function as baroreceptors and endocrine cells. And then shown in light blue here is extraglomerular mesangeal cells. These are cells that are sandwiched between the afferent and efferent arterioles, and they provide feedback between the other two areas of the complex. The juxtaglomerular cells are the cells that actually secrete the hormone renin. So the juxtaglomerular complex is an endocrine structure that secretes renin. Number two, differentiate between facultative water reabsorption and obligatory water reabsorption. So obligatory water reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule and the descending limb of the nephron loop. Water permeability in these areas cannot be adjusted, meaning the aquaporins are always present in the cell membranes. And during obligatory water reabsorption in these areas, 85% of the volume of filtrate is reabsorbed. Facultative water reabsorption occurs in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So water permeability in these areas is based on the presence or absence of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So if there is no ADH present, there would be no aquaporins in the cell membranes and so no water reabsorption. With ADH, aquaporins are inserted into the membranes and water is then reabsorbed. So remember, no ADH gives you large volumes of dilute urine ADH gives you small volumes of concentrated urine. In both cases, obligatory and facultative water reabsorption, water moves strictly by osmosis, so it moves to an area with a higher solute concentration, which you could also say it moves to an area with a higher osmolarity. Number three, describe the blood flow through the kidneys. So blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. It then goes out into segmental arteries. It then passes through the interlobar arteries that pass in the renal columns between the renal pyramids. It then goes into the arcuate arteries, which arc over the base of the renal pyramids. And then it radiates out into the cortex of the kidney in through the cortical radiate arteries. Now we're going to actually enter the nephron. So we enter the nephron by going through the afferent arteriole. So green in this image is going to represent the nephron. From the afferent arteriole, blood goes into the glomerular capillaries. And then it leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterioles. And then it passes around the renal tubule, so the PCT, the nephron loop, and the DCT, through the paratubular capillaries, and then in the juxtamedullary nephrons, the vasa recta. Blood then gets collected into venules. The venules are going to drain the blood into the cortical radiate veins, which are radiating out into the cortex of the kidney. It will then pass through the arcuate veins, which arc over the base of the renal pyramids, then into the interlobar veins, which pass down uh, in the renal columns between the pyramids, and then they are collected into the renal vein, which leaves the kidney. And that is the end of the Chapter 26 activity.